This is a 7,000-pound unlimited hydroplane streaking across the waters of the Ohio River, a waterbound aerodynamic missile plummeting through the spray in pursuit of boat racing's biggest prize, the Gold Cup. Speeds past 150 miles an hour on the straightaway. Dogged, tough, dangerous competition in the turns. That's coming up today on ABC's Wide World of Sports. The banks of the Ohio River as it flows by the community of Madison, Indiana. Population about 13,000 on a soft summer day. But it's the setting today with more than 100,000 people to watch the Gold Cup race for unlimited hydroplanes. It's an American folklore festival where thousands and thousands have come to enjoy themselves and just have some fun. Hello, I'm Keith Jackson. And you're about to see today on ABC's Wide World of Sports what we call the Thunderboats. The unlimited hydroplanes, the powerhouses of boat racing, run for the Gold Cup. This is the Grand Prix for the unlimited hydroplanes. This is the one every boat owner, every driver, every mechanic, every man in boat racing strives to win at one time or another because this is the top prize. But it became the top prize out of a lot of years of hard work, broken hearts, and meager success. Well, as you can see, we have a large crowd along the banks of the Ohio River here in Madison, Indiana for the Gold Cup race. I'm Keith Jackson here on the official stands in the pit area. And those of you who have seen unlimited hydroplane racing, I think know full well how complicated and difficult it can be. Let's take a look inside the cockpit now with a man who has won this race four times and who will be working with us today on ABC's Wide World of Sports when time allows. Here is Bill Muncy to explain some of the complicated jobs that he must do before this day is done. Thank you, Keith. I'm sitting in the cockpit of the Atlas fan line. It's a brand new unlimited hydroplane for 1971 and she's just been great. Like most of the hydroplanes in the pit area here today, she's 30 feet long, about 13 feet wide. She weighs about 6,500 pounds. She's powered by a British Rolls-Royce Merlin engine, which we hope to pull about 2,500 horsepower. And this will allow us to accelerate from 90 to 150 in about four and a half to five seconds with a top speed around 200. Though we do enjoy total aircraft instrumentation, we do uh, add a few goodies of our own just in the interest of uh, racing reference and racing improvement and performance. One of the most critical, of course, is the water speed indicator, which I've found is very accurate. Some other inst aircraft instruments that are important to us are the revolutions per minute of the engine, which tells me exactly how fast we're turning. We normally, at 150 miles an hour, turn this engine 4,000 revolutions per minute. Another important instrument is the manifold pressure gauge, which tells me how much boost or pressure we're getting into the combustion chamber from our supercharger. And it's important that if I'm going to put a lot of boost and pressure in there, I've got a lot of revolutions per minute to consume all that boost, because if it doesn't, I'm going to have an explosion and fire is going to come everywhere, and I won't win. Another little addition we've had, one of our own little racing goodies, is the nitrous oxide injection. This is a system that's installed inside the cockpit, but I control it with a little button on the steering wheel, and I can push that button coming off the corner in the interest of acceleration. It'll show me 400 horsepower additionally by just pushing nitrous oxide directly into the combustion chamber. This is the same thing that your dentist uses when he puts you to sleep and pulls your teeth out. So anyway, we are an aircraft, we're a waterbound airplane virtually, and we are totally aircraft oriented, although we're a boat, and we couldn't run without water because Water is the, what we cool the engine with. Water is the thing that we run on. And uh, hopefully water is the thing that we win on. OK, Bill, and frankly, I'd rather have my job than yours, because I know what kind of work you've got to do today. The course, it's compact, it's interesting, and it's a very fast course. Let's take a look at how it's laid out. The race course is two and a half miles in length, runs east to west on the Ohio River, which separates Indiana and Kentucky. The start-finish line right here is located on the Indiana side. They come streaking out from under that red line, which represents a bridge here on our graphic, and go boiling into that first turn, and that is pretty exciting. May very well be the most exciting point of the entire race course. And generally, it's reasonably smooth down there. They come off that first turn, up that long straight, hit their top speed right about this point. And right after they hit their top speed, they have to contend with some pretty tough ground swells that build up at this point of the race course come off turns three and four, and come on back down toward the start-finish line. The winner is determined on the basis of points, the point distribution as you see here. There will be three heats, two sections in each of the heats, and then the five boats with the greatest number of points will go into the final. And this is the Miss Madison, representing the host city being lifted into the water. 
Madison, Indiana is a community of about 13,000 people, and it's the first time ever in the history of the Gold Cup race a community this size has been able to hold an event of this size. And believe me, this is the big one in boat racing. So you will see through the afternoon some great enthusiasm for Miss Madison. Dean Chenoweth is the driver of Miss Budweiser. Now, Miss Budweiser is the defending champion. She won it in 1969 and 1970, has been running very well so far this year, and is very much in contention for all the honors. And here you see the Miss Timex moving out onto the river. Miss Timex in the field for Heat 1B. Heat 1A had to be stopped shortly after the start because of an accident that occurred in the first turn. It involved Bill Mutsey in the Atlas Van Lines and this young man, Leif Borgeson, driver of the Hallmark Home. Here is how Leif Borgeson recounts that exciting moment for him. Oh, we all came down to the starting line and we were pretty much abreast. We're all trying to get to that corner first. It's a very important factor in boat racing. And Bill had a little bit more mile per hour on myself and that pulled me down the chute by about two boat lengths. And we got into the corner and uh, Bill was going from number six lane over to number one. And the door just got closed. And uh, I tried to trip through his water a little bit because there was no other place to go. I tumbled in the air and hit four times on the surface of the water and was knocked out of wind for about 15, 20 seconds. And then the rescue craft finally got to me. Leif Borges is going to be sore for a few days, but he'll be back to race again. The Hallmark Holmes boat sunk. It's now at the bottom of the Ohio River. The rerun of Heat 1A was won by Atlas Van Lines 1, Bill Muncy for 400 points. Pride of Pay and Pack was second with Billy Shoemaker. Billy Sterrett took the Notre Dame in third. Miss Budweiser with Dean Cheney with did not finish. We'll be back for the running of Heat 1B on ABC's Wide World of Sports in just a moment. Four boats will make the start in Heat 1B of the Gold Cup race. Smythe Smoother Mover is not starting. And let's set the field for you. Miss Madison with Jim McCormick driving. Atlas Van Lines 2 with Terry Starrett driving. They're all watching this clock, the starting clock, as it blacks out. The starting gun will be fired, and everybody wants to be right on the line when it happens. Town Club is driven by Fred Alter, and Miss Timex driven by Ron Larson. Atlas Van Lines 2 right on the money. Here they go. Up here with us after winning the rerun of Heat 1A, Bill Muncy. Let's watch your teammate, Terry Sterrett, hit the first turn. And what a start he had, Keith. He comes smoking down that front chute at about 150 miles an hour, and he'll probably try and get into the corner at about 135, but he's going to have to take that heavier boat a little wide, and there's a good possibility that the... Well, I don't want to call him devious. He's just darn good, but Jim McCormick, as you can see, could duck underneath him and take a good run on him and establish uh, a right away in that one lane so the traffic could get fast and thick coming down. Now let's watch the uh, Miss Madison. Bill, I think uh, you've commented, a number of people have commented that between 90 and 120, this one can really go, and here comes the Madison running on the right side of the screen. And this is strong forte. As he moves into one lane, he's got the right away, and he's got the field on the hip, and Freddie Alder sitting back in the town club has his boat running beautifully, too, but as you mentioned earlier, Keith, here's some rough, rough water, and there on the right we have uh, the town club bouncing through it and into that corner in, in very heavy traffic. One of the characteristics of the driving of Jim McCormick is he tries to run as tight to the buoys as he can and run the tighter course. Miss Timex has now dropped well off the pace, and the battle goes on between Miss Madison, Atlas Van Lines 2, and the town club hanging on. And to those fans who've maybe watched the sport for years, this is the big battle that everybody seems to like. They like the Allison engine powering the Madison. They like the Rolls Royce and the Atlas. Here's the big contention, the big fight that we've been talking ever since the Second World War. And Fred Alter trying to duck inside with the town club uh, has the door shut on him by Jim McCormick as they go through the turn. You, now you see the sliding action. The three-point suspension hydroplane doesn't really draw much water on the straightaway when it's up and planing at full speed. But now watch as Atlas Van Lines with Terry Sterrett. Apparently he went to the nitrous and come popping off and suddenly he jumps back into the lead. This is a tight battle between the Atlas and the Rolls Royce and Terry's got the Atlas Van Lines moving beautifully. Turning about 4,000 revolutions per minute with a propeller speed of 12,000 revolutions per minute, he's saying about 150 miles an hour, and as you can see, goes in on that boat tight just to give McCormick just enough room in the Madison, but not a lot of room, just enough to negotiate, maybe to slow him down a little bit. You indicated earlier that you get about 400 extra horsepower when you go to that, uh, what you call laughing gas. Yeah, and it gets a lot of laughing done. You laugh all the way to the bank if you can keep it glued together. Of course, it makes your engine run a little leaner, and as a result, your piston temperatures are hotter, and you can, you can melt an engine down. 
So we have had the lead. Change hands a couple of times right now. Terry Sterrett he is running in first place. Miss Madison has dropped back into second place. Town Club with the veteran Fred Alter. He is running in third and Miss Timex is fourth. And at these speeds, there isn't that much between first, second, and third. And while Atlas Van Lines 2 is leading rather comfortably at this moment, the Town Club with Fred Alter has pulled up well alongside the Madison and may take a run at him. Fred Alter and Jim McCormick are having a real go, and it looks like Fred's got that boat. Mo he moved outside the wake, and he's running deeper in the corner, and so as a result, of Miss Madison's going to be able to run a shorter course and get off that corner ahead of Freddie. Now watch Freddie make this boat move, and I'm surprised to see Fred moving this boat as quickly and uh, moving in a fast track as he is because he hasn't been running that much this year. Now he does not want to cross the wake any more than he has to. It does two or three things. One, it costs you about a second every time you go across it, and the other thing is that it beats up your equipment. It does. It, it, you're laboring your equipment. You're making that blower work harder, and you're making, uh, sometimes you're increasing the friction areas, and of course this slows you down a little more. It takes more power to go faster. The Atlas fan lines well out in front, inside, battling for second place is the Madison, running tight with him is Fred Alter in the town club. Let's see if Fred can hold it on the boys this time. He's holding it much better here at this turn than he did in the last. It seems that the Madison lugs down a little bit as it gets into cavitation in the turn, and Fred Alter, with that black smoke coming out, means that he has given it a shot. Let's see what he can do on the straight. He's going to that nitrous oxide, and here Fred's challenging him. He seems to be able to do this at will. Every time he gets into trouble in the, in the straightaway or in the corner, he can move that boat back up through the pack and become a... And there he goes by. He's moving to second place now. And that gets a wail from the beach as the crowd of better than 100,000 watch the Miss Madison drop back into third place. But let's see now if Fred Alter can shut the door on Jim McCormick. Fred is still not that tight on the boy. McCormick runs. He just likes to rub him. And you see Fred Alter going way wide. But it seems to me that Fred did hit some rollers just prior to setting up for going into the corner and isn't able to maintain as tight a radius as Jim McCormick is in the Miss Madison. But here he comes. He's still able to drag him pretty well on the long straight. Atlas Van Lines, too, running well out in front. And the dogfight is for second place. It's worth 300 points here in 1B, so it's certainly worth fighting for. And he's challenging him again, but they're heading towards that rough water down just beyond the bridge, and that's pretty exciting. As you can see, the Atlas moving into that, into that corner in a very nice tight radius. He's moving in there about 135 miles an hour, Keith. Moves in at 135, and we watch two of them go banging in at about that speed. And this time, we watch Fred Alter to see if he can hang on that right sponson of the Madison, and he's hanging there very well. And now it'll be a sprint down the near straight. Fred seems to, at will, be able to accelerate and move down the straightaway and move ahead of the of the Atlas and this or the uh, of the Madison. He'll take a run at him just like he did before. It's a 60-mile race, and you don't like to put this much pressure on your equipment in the first heat. But the points are so important. First place is worth 400, second 300, third 225, and here comes Fred Alder pulling up on the Madison again. But just prior to, he's always able to do it at the end of the straightaway when he has to begin to accelerating for the turn, and there he dropped his right sponson. Dropped the right sponson and is pulled into starboard. He almost turned over. He's way up on the right side. But he still has the engine working and knowing Fred Alter and goodness knows we've seen him drive every kind of boat in every kind of condition he's tough trailing the field Miss Timex holding on to fourth place which is going to be worth 169 points to it if it hangs in there see that Fred uh, Fred's a tough guy he's been in this sport for years and years had great experience and I hope he can uh, keep that boat moving and here comes Atlas Van Lines 2 with young Terry Sterrett taking the checkered flag and winning heat 1B worth 400 points Miss Madison takes second place for 300 points in Town Club, the tail fin. Wobbling and waving, and I would expect we'll see Fred running without that tail fin the rest of the day. And a section just behind the seat is, is dislodged or torn away too. So it's 225 points for third, and Miss Timex will take fourth for 169 points. And remember, it is total points at the end of 60 miles of racing that determines the winner of the Gold Cup. Bill Muncy, you go ahead and get suited up for the next action in the Gold Cup race from Madison, Indiana, coming up on ABC's Wide World of Sports.
There you see the pride of pay and pack driven by Bill Shoemaker coasting into the pier after winning heat 2A. Now total 700 points. Atlas Van Lines was second in heat 2A for 700 points. This is the Miss Budweiser with a stack fire. Dean Chaneywith trying to ease it away from the pier and out onto the river for heat 2B. And this one ought to be a hot one because the Madison Budweiser, Atlas Van Lines, and Notre Dame are all in it. Let's get a word from Bill Mutsy down on the dock just before he goes out for heat 2B. Indeed, this is the situation at this point. I got to go out and try and I, it'd be nice if I can win the heat, but uh, we're in awfully good shape. I don't want to blow anything. I want to make sure I run at least second uh, because it's an all-day race. I got two more heats to go, so uh, I'll go out and go for the first if I can get it easily without bringing anything. If I can, if I have to pull a second, I'll be delighted to do that. All right, Bill, thank you. That gentleman there with Bill Muncie is Lee Shaneth, who owns the boat. Bill is driving. And while we are waiting for the field for Heat 2B to get out onto the river, let's go back and look at the rerun of Heat 1A. There in the center of the picture, you have the Atlas, driven by Bill Muncie, the Budweiser running right along with him. And as they come to that first turn, they get to the posture off the start that has produced some contentious conversation having to do with the accident that stopped the original start of 1A. Now let's freeze our picture to give you some idea of what we're talking about. Here on the left side of the picture is Bill Munch in the Atlas, on the right side the Budweiser, and even though they are both bouncing and hurtling along at 140 miles an hour, you can see as Muncie starts his turn here, the rerun of 1A, he still leaves room enough for the Budweiser to get by. In other words, an open lane of water. That's what the rule book says you gotta do. Munchie went on to take 400 points in the heat, and the pay and pack took 300 points, coming in in second place, driven by Billy Shoemaker. And is very much in it, as we told you a moment ago. And the Notre Dame, with Billy Starrett, took third place. For 225 points, Shirley McDonald's boat. And the Miss Budweiser was towed back to the pits, did not finish, and did not get any points. So the defending champion is not having a good day. All right, now that we have looked back, let's look ahead to Heat 2B. And as the clock spins around to blackout and the field for 2B comes hurtling towards the starting line, it's Miss Madison with Jim McCormick, Miss Budweiser, Dean Chaneywith, Atlas Van Lines 1 with Bill Mutsey on Notre Dame with Bill Sterrett, the gun, and here they go. That's Budweiser inside, Notre Dame in lane 2, Bill Mutsey in lane 3. On the run for the first turn. And it's Miss Madison well outside and not in the picture right now. On the right side is Budweiser. In the middle is Notre Dame. And on, on the left side of the picture is the Atlas. And they're coming up on the first turn. Look out, the Notre Dame caught in the middle. Goes bouncing through Bill Bunce's rooster tail and slows down. The Budweiser has slowed down in the first turn. The Atlas on through successfully. The Madison comes around and makes it through all right. The Notre Dame is settling down and has gone dead in the water. There goes the Madison by it. The Budweiser is restarting and getting back into it. Meantime, the Atlas with Bill Muncy has gone on down and headed into the next turn. This Madison has now moved up into second place and is really moving. There's Lee Shaneth, the owner of the lead boat, Atlas, right now. He may be a little bit concerned about what happened and what caused this particular boat right here to go dead in the water of the Notre Dame. Billy Sturridge trying to get it up and moving again. And let's go back here and take a quick look at what did happen down there, see if we can pick it out. That's the Atlas with Muncie on the left, Billy Sturridge and the Notre Dame in the middle, Dean Chaneywith in the Budweiser on the right. Now here they start to make the turn. Question is, and I'm sure a question in the mind of all of the officials, did Bill Muncy chop the Notre Dame and force him to run through that wall of water in the rooster tail and almost take a dip? Or was there room? Was the Notre Dame going too fast and not able to make the turn? I frankly don't think that the Budweiser was involved in any washing down there or any chopping, but meantime, uh, the Atlas continues to tool around the course and we're waiting for some indication as to whether or not the course judge is gonna make a judgment at this point. That is the Madison now running in second place and slowing down as Jim McCormick moves through the turn. The Notre Dame is still sitting down there trying to get it going. Billy Starrett's still pumping away, but Jim McCormick doesn't want to come through there too hot and go banging into it. So as the Madison pulls out onto the straightaway, the Budweiser is up and running now in third place. It's Atlas, Madison, Budweiser, and everybody waiting for the Notre Dame. And Sturridge still banging away at it, and looks like he may get it going this time. And 
he brings it up into the planing position, so the Notre Dame is running again and in fourth spot. Well, here we are, waiting for the judgment. You have the man sitting in a little boat down there in that first turn, called the course judge, who reports to the referee, Bill Newton. And so far, we have not had the word on any kind of a decision involving this man, Bill Muncy, driving the Atlas Van Lines number one and leading at this point in heat two B. Miss Madison is running in second place. But the telephone lines are busy, and here comes the word. The word is that Bill Muncy is going to be penalized one lap for chopping the Notre Dame. So that puts this boat, Miss Madison, in first place. And when the word gets around the beach that Madison is now leading in Heat 2B, that crowd will wake up. More than 100,000 people have gathered in this little community of some 13,000, and they love everything about their boat. So Bill Muncie in the Atlas Van Lines 1 is now actually running in third place because of the one lap penalty. And again, rule 35 of the rule book states very clearly that you must give three boat lengths of open water or freedom to the trailing boat before you initiate a turn. And in the judgment of the course judge, it was not done. And as a result of that decision from on the course, the referee has penalized Bill Muncy one lap, which drops him out of first place. Miss Madison, if Jim McCormick keeps it where it is, will pick up 400 big points. And at the end of Heat 2B, we'll have 700 tying him in points with pay it pack and Atlas Van Lines 2. At the end of two heats, the checkered flag goes down, and Miss Madison totals 700 points. The Budweiser is going to take second place, 300 points, because the Budweiser did not finish its first heat. Here comes the Atlas Van Lines floating to the pier now as Bill Muncy is out of the helmet. He gets the thumbs down sign from one of his crew members. The indication is that he was penalized. The extra lap had to go around again. And I think there you see a very unhappy man. So Bill Muncy a bit disgusted with what has happened to him out on the race course today. He has been involved in two very exciting moments of unlimited hydroplane racing. The Notre Dame is coming in. And the order of finish in heat 2B, Miss Madison wins it, total 700 points for the two heats. Miss Budweiser has second place, Atlas Van Lines is third, and the Notre Dame finishes fourth. And we'll be back with more from Madison, Indiana, and the Gold Cup race in a moment. Let's spend some time right now with Guy Lombardo, a man who won this event, 25 yeah. in America and its entertainment habits. It must have been a little disquieting to a lot of other people. Myself, I know I was a little disturbed to hear that you were screaming around on uh, water in a race boat at 100 plus miles an hour and winning most of the major trophies. Did you ever have a serious wreck? I did have one, Keith, in uh, Detroit. Uh, luckily, I got out fairly well. I had a broken arm and all that. But uh, considering all the races and all the times I was in a race boat, <laughs> I think uh, I was above the average. I had less of a problem than anyone else. Of course, I um, always tried to do it the safe way. I saw that my equipment was properly uh, properly set up. Because these boats do take a terrible beating. When you're running around 150 miles an hour down these straightaways, everything has to be pretty well glued together. You know, physical endurance, a lot of people say, well, he's just driving a boat around or he's just driving a car around or whatever, but there's an element of physical endurance, and particularly in a 60-mile race like this one. Well, as a matter of fact, from 1946, when I started driving Unlimiteds, my neck size, my shoulder size, my neck size went from 14 and a half to 16 and a half in one year. That's a tremendous physical effort because, after all, you can't strap yourself in the boat. You have to build yourself into the boat. You have to have something to press you against the back seat so that you're secure. But if the boat flips, you have to get out. There's no such thing as being strapped in. Now, when you raced, though, you were still, when uh, back in 46 when you won and uh, was running the tempo, you still used uh, seat belts. Uh, some of them did. No, I <clears throat> no, we didn't. And I was against it, and I warned the other fellows about it. And a couple of the boys were hurt on account of the seat belts. Matter of fact, one of my very best friends Went out of a boat, he took the seat with him, and the guy's tank that was underneath the thing. So he uh, had a pretty close call, and that tipped the other fellows off that seat belts are not for race boats. You can build yourself into the boat. 
so that you're secure without having that danger of a seatbelt. A man like yourself who has won the top prize in unlimited racing, the Gold Cup, I guess you never really ever will forget it, will you? No, I dare say Keith thrill in my life. And uh, I want, you know, I've had a lot of wonderful thrills, being a band leader, and we've played everywhere, and had a lot of wonderful things. But I think when I won the Gold Cup, <laughs> that was the crowning achievement of my whole life. Guy Lombardo, who's Temple, won the Gold Cup in 1946, and we're delighted to have him back on shore watching with us. Here we go now with a field for Heat 3A. Miss Budweiser, Dean Cheney with driving, 300 points, Town Club, Fred Alter, 394, Atlas Fan Lines 1, Bill Muncy, the driver, 625 points, and Miss Timex, Ron Larson driving, 169 points. The Atlas Fan Lines 1 with Bill Muncy has the greater number of points in this particular heat. And remember, the five boats with the greatest number of points will be the five boats that will go into that final heat for the Gold Cup. And here they come boiling down for the start of Heat 3A. It is Budweiser, it is Atlas, it is Town Club, it is Timex. And Budweiser is across first with Atlas running second, Town Club third. And Timex is in fourth spot as they thunder towards the first turn. And Budweiser has a clear lead in the turn. Coming to the outside is the Atlas Van Lines one with Bill Muncy in second spot. Now they start the acceleration up the back straight. The Budweiser having won the Gold Cup in 1969 and 70. The Atlas taking a run at the Bud now on the long straight. Up around 150, maybe 160 miles an hour. And the Atlas bouncing, banging, and something is torn loose. So the Atlas Van Lines 1 is in trouble. The right side of the boat looks like a sponson has ripped off. Water spewing up. The Budweiser pulls well out, but that should bring out the red flares and the red flags. And there they are. And the race has been stopped. And when you lose that much of your boat, that suddenly, obviously, you've got a hole in it. And there you see the results. Bill Muncy is still in the cockpit. There is no fire, no apparent danger to him. But the boat is sinking. He tried to run it as far as he could over towards shore so that if it does sink, it'll sink in shallow water, making it much easier to get it out. So right here, you're about to watch a piece of machinery that's valued at least at $100,000 sink silently and slowly beneath the blue surface of the Ohio River. And so as Bill Muncy takes to the water for a short swim, and his boat settles to the bottom. The race has been stopped. Well, I gotta say this, that Bill Muncy has shown us a lot of class. He stopped an argument by sinking his boat. We'll be back to talk with him right after this. Well, as you can see, Bill Muncy is a bit wet, shaken up perhaps, but he appears to be all right. And as he makes his way back toward his trailer and looks for a towel, let's see if we can find out what happened. Bill? All I did was develop an oil leak uh, during a warm-up, and I couldn't see, so I had to throw my goggles off, and I hit some rollers. No, I'm fine. I didn't get a mark, really. Your chest all right? Yeah, I just Legs? out of breath. Just knocked the wind out of me. I'm just great shape. I'm you broke fun. my toy. I know it. I lost our gold <laughs> cup. That's where I hurt. Well, right you're okay. Heart. We can fix the boat. Well, some toy. You heard the owner, Lee Shaneth, say, you broke my toy. Well, it sits on the bottom of the river right now. There's Bill Muncy's wife, Fran, coming to the pier to greet him. But he's all right, and we'll hear more from him a little later. Obviously, this has stopped things in Madison, Indiana, and the gold cup race for a little while. So while we're waiting for the action to resume here, we're going to reflect to an event seen earlier on ABC's Wide World of Sports, Bill Fleming and the International Motocross Motorcycle Race from Bay Mare, California.
Keith Jackson back here at the pits along the Ohio River, Madison, Indiana, and we're just a few minutes away from the final heat in the Gold Cup race. With me, Bill Muncy, whom we have seen in action earlier today. You look drier. <laughs> you know what, Keith? I've never been one to believe really in, uh, in luck. I believe in God, and I believe in preparation, and if you could make a differentiation between luck and breaks, I'd maybe listen to you a little bit, but... Uh, Today wasn't my day, I guess. We tried awfully hard. This is a fast track, and uh, we're, we were running very, very fast. It's one of those things. Bill, I guess there's never been a Gold Cup race, or and certainly not very many, in which they just ran off right on schedule and everything went according to plan. You have been involved in three incidences in which there have been some arguments and protests and what have you. We've heard uh, the other side of it. Now we'd like to take some of our film, go back and freeze the frame, stop it, slow it down, and take a look at it with you. Well, in my opinion, Leif Borgerson and the Hallmark Holmes were moving up into the apex of two rooster tails, the Budweiser's and mine, and when he got up in there, if he'd have remained in the lane that he was in, I think he'd have probably negotiated the corner beautifully. But I think from a strategic point of view, he probably decided to be wiser not to take a chance and get wet down and to go through my tail and move on the outside, and sometimes this can work beautifully. You maintain your boat speed, you go through the tail, you don't get wet, you accelerate off the exit pin. Now, here we are on the rerun of 1A, the Budweiser on the right and you on the left. Well, my boat is a little bit out of attitude, and sometimes when you come down on it, it'll veer to the right or to the left. But in this instance, as you can see, we were able to go to the, we went to the port side just a bit, and there was enough room, another lane left there for the Budweiser to negotiate. Heat 2B involving the Notre Dame and again the Budweiser. You're on the left, Notre Dame in the middle, and the Bud on the right. This is the only incidence in which there was a penalty call. And this seems to be an identical situation where the Notre Dame is coming up into the apex of two rooster tails, the Budweiser's and mine, and the throttle works both ways. You have to back off uh, and go through a tail or stay in the lane that you're in. And I think if he'd have stayed in the lane that he was in, he had nego negotiated that corner in great shape. There was a lot of room for him to move there. But the rooster tails, as you turn left, fall to the right. And he probably didn't want to really get caught in either one of them. I think it was a mistake or an error in judgment. Now, at 3B, the pay pack was penalized a lap, also involving the Notre Dame. Well, it's an identical situation here. The pay and pack is free, and to the left, you can see plenty of room for the Notre Dame and Bill Starr to move, but he chose to go through the rooster tail, or he went a little too hot, could maintain the radius, and was forced to go through the tail. All right, let's slow our picture down and take one more look at it. The Madison is tight on the buoy. Notre Dame is running last, starts to slide out to the right as the field made its turn, and it was this moment that cost the pay and pack a lap penalty. The ruling was that he had chopped the Notre Dame, whereas I think you can see the Notre Dame seemed to slide off to the right as the rest of the field was making the turn. But judgment calls are always tough. And so we come to what is always the most exciting moment in any kind of racing competition, those few breathless moments just before the finale. Now here are the five boats that will go into the final heat. Atlas II, driven by Terry Sterrett with 1,100 points. Miss Madison, driven by Jim McCormick with 1,000 points. Pay and Pack, driven by Billy Shoemaker, 869 points. Town Club, with Fred Alter driving, 750 points. And the Budweiser, with Dean Cheney with at the wheel, 700 points. Now let's consider the possibilities. Looking at the Atlas II with 1,100 points and Madison with 1,000 points. If, for example, Madison should win the final heat, 400 points, Atlas II takes second place for 300 points, they would wind up tied in total points. The boat that comes across that finish line first, the order of finish, will determine the winner of the Gold Cup, even if they should wind up tied in points. The final huddles for the final heat of the 1971 Gold Cup race, Miss Budweiser, last year's national champion, last year's Gold Cup winner. On the right, George McKernan, his driver, Dean Chenoweth, co-owner, Bernie Little. Everybody has to know what's going on in this race, Keith, because the points are extremely important. The Budweiser hasn't had a great day today, but they might catch the Atlas fan lines. Here you have them. Terry Starrett, Jim Kurth, Lee Shanoff. Everybody is talking about the strategy, because as you drive the boat, you've got to add the points. And here you have Jim McCormick along with Harry Volpe and Tony Steinhauer and Bobby Humphrey, you represent the city of Madison, who've done an amazing thing. Really, they went out and bid for the Gold Cup. They've staged it magnificently, and now they're on, on the threshold of possibly winning it. It's got to be a magnificent well, thing for them. It seems to be pretty good. I believe the win the way it is right now will be much better than it was yesterday because it's dissipating the wake of the other boats with the chop, uh, which is a lot better than having a flat water like we did yesterday when the, when the wake of the other boats just lays there. I didn't notice any bad holes any place around that time. 
your your acceleration's on coming out will be all right, you think? I think it's all right. It's not as good as it was with the 18 yeah. to yeah. wheel, but we know that. We got a little yeah. more shoot speed and a little less okay. RPM. Okay, very good. Okay, Jim, let's go put down the trailer. Good luck. Okay, baby. And I'll guarantee you if Miss Madison should win it, this countryside will erupt with joy. We'll have a look at the final heat of the Gold Cup in just a moment. The final heat of the Grand Prix in boat racing, the Gold Cup for unlimited hydroplanes. Atlas II, Miss Madison, Hay and Pack, Town Club, Budweiser, the starting clock. As it blacks out completely. Here they come. It is a good start. And Atlas Van Lines breaks on top, heading into that first corner. Keith, it looks to me like the field as it moves down into that first corner is really moving well this is the one where you let it all hang out you turn out everything you've got and you hope for the best because the points aren't that well distributed you've got two strong boats with atlas and the madison with over a thousand points but here you've got the two strongest boats with the most points uh, battling for first place and atlas comes off the corner first atlas two with young 23 year old terry sterrett in his second year of driving the big boat leads coming off the first turn madison is second and you know who they're rooting for. Madison on the inside, moving up in a hurry on the back straightaway. Jim McCormick pushing it, coming off the turn. He has the lead. So Jim McCormick in the lighter and perhaps more maneuverable. Miss Madison grabs the lead. Terry Sterrett and Atlas II is on the outside. And Bill, I think it should be noted here that the Atlas II is a heavier boat. About a thousand pounds heavier, I think, Keith. And uh, Jim McCormick handled that beautifully, accelerating from 90 to 120 miles an hour faster than anybody in racing today. And even though Terry came down the back chute, really smoking into that cut corner, he isn't able to stay with Jim McCormick coming off the corner and move down the front chute as Jim moves the Miss Madison at this point. And as the Madison runs along in front of the Atlas, you can cut the anticipation of this big crowd. I won't say that everybody on shore is rooting for Miss Madison, but I'll guarantee you the bulk of them are. Jim McCormick running straight at you, 37-year-old. He's been around boat racing a long time. He's from Owensboro, Kentucky. He has never won a major unlimited hydroplane race. And setting the field, Miss Madison has a substantial lead, running in second place. Atlas Van Lines with Terry Sturrett. In third place, Miss Budweiser with Dean Chenoweth. In fourth place, Pay and Pack Billy Shoemaker. In fifth place, Town Club Fred Alter. The Ohio River, very flat, very little current because a series of hydroelectric dams have been built, slowing down the current, and the running conditions right now are very good. And the running condition of Miss Madison, the lead boat, is very good as Jim McCormick has the field on his hip. He's running a little better than 102 miles an hour, so he is not in a position of coasting around, waiting for somebody to break down. He has just simply taken the field by the horns, and he's given him a good shaking right now. Nobody wants to deny the fact that the Miss Madison has been one of the most consistent performers all year long. They haven't been able to put a win together, but they've had people like the Atlas Van Lines here with uh, Terry Sterrett just chasing them all over the United States and uh, McCormick with his consistencies plus determination after 10 years. I think it's going to be awfully tough to beat for the balance of this heat. In the meantime, Terry, he's a young guy. This is just the second event that he's driven this boat in, and I just think he's handled it beautifully all day he long. He certainly has. And also noting the point totals, the point leaders are Atlas II with 1,100 going into this final heat. Madison had 1,000. The other three boats in it in the five-boat field over the two-and-a-half-mile course can only hope that something happens to the two leaders, Pay and Pack Town Club and Budweiser. But right now, Madison continues to skim along. Very little cavitation in the turns as McCormick continues. And I said a moment ago, Bill, he has the field on his hip. Perhaps you could clarify that a little bit. Well, of course, the boat is 30 foot long, and he's got a rooster tail back there about 150 feet. And as you can see, the water coming up off the Atlas van lines here with Terry, uh, it's not a weapon, but it goes back a long way. And you can keep the balance of the field. You always to port, you know, or a starboard. As Dean Chaneyworth driving Miss Budweiser. Budweiser won it 1969, 1970. It looks grim for a chance to repeat. Here's one of the coming young drivers, Billy Shoemaker, in the pay and pack. The boat has run quite well here today, but he is running fourth right now. And in fifth spot is Fred Alter, and his boat, the Town Club, has been altered, as you can see. No tail on it, but Fred Alter drive a barrel if you put an engine on it and be tough. And Keith, here's where we reliability becomes a factor. Everybody has established a position on the race course. We've got a lot of racing yet to go, and yet 
can we stay glued together? Can we keep these machines moving at 4,000 revolutions per minute? Tremendous cockpit temperature, probably around 150 to 160 degrees. Every driver here will probably lose five to eight pounds this afternoon. So try and live in a lane that is strategically sound enough that you can live with it, but maybe we'll break somebody else and move you up one, one slot. Now, in the position that Jim McCormick enjoys right now, well out in front, it is a position every man would like to have because at this moment, he has no pressure other than keeping his equipment alive. And of course, the Allison is a critical engine, and the Rolls is a strong engine. The Rolls has a reputation for maybe a little more power at certain uh, revolutions per minute. But on the other hand, uh, they've had dependability here that is absolutely phenomenal. Now, if he can keep it alive and bring it down to get the checkered flag, this countryside will burst with enthusiasm because this is a community-owned boat, as we have pointed out. It is a boat that has not won a race since it won the Dixie Cup in 1965 with Buddy Byers driving. It won another smaller race in Seattle in 1961. 37-year-old Jim McCormick has never won a major unlimited hydroplane race. It is not a nickel and dime operation, but it is an operation that is supported by the men who live, work, and love Madison, Indiana. And they love this boat. The checkered flag is out. The crowd is on its feet. And here's the finish of the Gold Cup race. And Miss Madison has won it. In second place, Atlas Van Lines 2, Terry Sterrett driving. In third place, in the final heat, the Budweiser, Dean Chenoweth driving it. And in fourth, Billy Shoemaker. And the pride of Pay and Pack, owned by Dave Herensberger. And Fred Alter in the town club finishes in fifth. Well, in the background, I think you can hear how these people feel about what has happened in front of them this afternoon as their boat has won the Gold Cup race. We'll be back to sample and enjoy some of this fun and happiness in just a moment. Well, they say a picture is worth a thousand words. There's one right there. Jim McCormick's wife, Bonnie. The crew, the crowd, the town. They couldn't be happier. Miss Madison wins the Gold Cup at home. Tony Steinhardt, the manager of the Miss Madison crew, first on the boat. Thank you, Keith, very much. I can't hardly believe it. You never won one, and you won the big one in front of the hometown. And this is the only one we've really been aiming for for many, many years. You guys were kind of sitting quietly here, just watching everybody else go out there and chuck away, and suddenly here you are in the driver's seat, and you took it the right way. Well, they put it in there. They went over the engine the last heat, and they said, it's ready to go. Let's let it all hang out. We'll either win it or blow. Oh, Keith, you can't believe how happy we are, oh, I really. I bet you are. I bet you are. Bless your heart. Celebrate with them. We are going to celebrate. That a boy, Jim McCormick, the winner of the Gold Cup. Oh, man, how about that? Well, I guess, Bill Muncy, this should prove to be an inspiration to any community anywhere that would like to have an unlimited hydroplane race. Madison, Indiana has proven that you can have it and you can succeed with it. How many times have I heard, Keith, the mountains there, it's very big. Why do we climb it and all that kind of thing? Why do we drive unlimited hydroplanes on the Ohio River in a gold cup? Here it is, a typical example, because, only because it's just a great experience to win. <laughs> Never won a race for five years and he picked the gold cup at home. How about that? And it sets in motion what surely will be the biggest celebration that Madison, Indiana has ever had. The final standing, Miss Madison wins it, Atlas Band Lines is second, Pay and Pack third, Miss Budweiser four, and Town Club fifth.
The executive producer of ABC's Wide World of Sports is Rune Arlitz. Gold Cup Hydroplane Race produced by Ned Steckel, directed by Don Olmeyer. International Cross Country Motocross Motorcycle Race produced and directed by Andy Sedaris. Production coordinator for ABC's Wide World of Sports is Dennis Lewis. Program administrator, John Martin. Be sure to join us next Saturday on ABC's Wide World of Sports for the Calgary Stampede Rodeo along with the National Air Races. And now this is Keith Jackson along with Bill Muncy saying so long from Madison, Indiana. Air travel arranged through and promotional fee paid by American Airlines. American has more 747s flying to more places in the United States than any other airline. It's good to know you're on American. Today's program, pre-recorded. <laughs>